Okie dokie. Let me just get rid of the little videos on my screen. Almost there. Fabulous. So here we are, cats and cat food. Webinar with Naturally Cat. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to give you an overview as to what we're going to cover. So with cat food, it is a huge topic. And whilst I was doing my research, I, like I said, just a moment ago, I went off on several tangents and it's really hard in a way to kind of narrow it down to be key topics that you will all benefit from learning about. So I tried to keep parts of it high level. Like I said, we will have questions at the end if you want to be more specific. We're gonna look at what is a species appropriate diet for a cat, the pros and cons of dry food, alternative options, um, how to read a cat food label, what poor quality cat food can do to your cat and how much you should feed your cat. So as I said, feel free to put comments um, uh, on the screen as we go through and uh, we'll cover them at the end. So who am I? For those of you that know me, my name is Julianne Thorne. Um, I created Naturally Cats, crikey, a good few years ago now. And I call myself a holistic feline behaviorist because it, it's easier to understand. You know, if you say you're a behaviorist, people know what you do. Whereas actually what I am is a, is a holistic feline practitioner. So I help people that have problems with their cats. And usually that comes to me as problem behaviors. But actually what we find out nine times out of 10 is that there's usually like an emotional problem or there's potentially issues with the environment. So I look at the whole picture. I don't just look at a symptom. I look at the whole situation. So the environment, the relationships with other animals and humans in the house, diet, nutrition, behavior patterns, you know, litter tray facilities, etc. So I look at it all because I don't believe that looking at one element will solve a problem. I think if you solve that problem, you're just potentially going to create another one somewhere else. So I'm also a pet bereavement counselor. The picture just there at the bottom is my dear cat Pickle. And when she was put to sleep, we it, it was very traumatic for me. And I decided to channel my grief to become a pet bereavement counselor to help other people through what could be what can be a potentially traumatic time also a cat mum so as you can see in the top right there that's me and leo i think i've got a christmas top on actually and uh, leo is our current cat and he is a little angel again he's teaching me so much he's asthmatic so we've gone from having pickle who is diabetic to leo who is asthmatic and as you can see, his ear is slightly tipped at the top because he was previously feral and he was part of a trap, neuter and return program. So they tipped his ear to show that he'd been done, he'd been fixed, and uh, then he was re-released. But actually, to cut a long story short, he ended up coming to a rescue centre and now he's ours. So I consider myself an educator feline guardian. So when I work with a family, it isn't just about you know sorting the problem behavior with the cat it's also about helping people understand understand cats you know to understand how they can provide for their cat and what they need to consider and the last one personal mission to change the world's perception of cats no no small feat right no small dream so you'll see the bottom of every slide and i've put it there at the bottom hashtag giving cats a voice so i've always been drawn to cats and i feel they're very misunderstood my new blog coming on the 15th is all about cats as sentient beings. And I talk in there about how people speak derogatorily about cats and, and how, you know, people are just so misunderstood. People think that they're aloof and they don't need company and that's really not the case. So my mission is to help people see that cats are amazing. They are, you know, sentient, soulful beings that need to be listened to. They, they need you know, they have emotional needs, not just, you know, physical needs. 
So as we talk about cat food today, I just want to say that everything that I'm going to talk about is based on my experience, either with Pickle or with Leo. So again, Naturally Cats isn't about preaching something. It's about, it's all about what I've experienced with my two cats. How I am today, what I believe today has come from the experiences that I've had with them. The work that I've had to do, the, you know, the investigations that I've had to do. So it's not something that I'm saying this is the only way. I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. All I'm saying is this is what we do. This is what I found works. And this is why, which is what I want to share with you today. So what is a species appropriate diet? So... <laughs> I googled this and I found it really funny that the first image, so literally like, you know, when you Google something at the top, you've got the, the banner in the box, the information in the box. And when I typed in what is a species appropriate diet, that's the picture that was there. So, uh, you know, a wild cat, a large cat, obviously tiger with a carcass with meat, you know, what is it, it looks like ribs. So a species appropriate diet literally means, you know, what that species needs to eat. And it is not just about what they need to survive, it's what, it's what they need to thrive. So what is it they need to eat to be healthy, to be well? So for cats, they are obligate carnivores, they're carnivores. So they get their nutrients from animal flesh. So I just want to kind of hover on that point a moment because that is something that is getting lost in translation with our domesticated animals, with our domesticated cats. They require nutrients that are only found in animal flesh. So cats need to eat meat to, to like I said, to thrive and to survive. So the picture that's there, the big cats in the wild, obviously they feed on prey, you know, I don't know, buffaloes or, or whatever, um, that they, they eat animals. And they don't just eat the flesh, they eat the bones, they eat the organs. And if you think about how that travels down to our domesticated cats, for anybody, anybody that's got an outdoor cat, you know, I'm sure you've had gifts and presents. We've, we've certainly had some from Leo. You can tell he was previously feral. You know, he brings us voles and mice um, and a slow worm. Well, um, but for our small cats, you know, if you think about what they need, they need the same thing. They need bones, flesh, organs, etc. Now, one thing to mention is that when, when people talk about cats and people will mention, oh, they, you know, they eat, they need fruit or vegetables. They don't. They don't need the nutrients from them. And actually, they don't have the necessary bodily functions, if you like, or, or um, you know, the right makeup, the, the right processes in their body to be able to fully digest plant matter or you know, fruits and vegetables. And actually, a lot of the time, cats will use plant matter to make themselves sick, so as an emetic. So think about when cats eat grass, whether that's an outdoor cat or whether you've um, uh, got an indoor cat that you grow cat grass for perhaps, they, they will use it to make themselves sick because potentially they've got a fair ball or their digestion is a bit uneasy, you know, their, their tummy's a bit unsettled. So that, that's, I've put this here to be really basic and really simple. You know, the, the bottom line is a species appropriate diet for cats, they're carnivores. A species appropriate diet for carnivores is meat, flesh, bones, offal, you know, liver, kidneys, et cetera, organs. And, and, I, and I know it sounds really simple, but I just want you to be aware of that for a moment. You know, let's take it back to that simple element that's what our cats need. That's the way that their biology works. That's what they need to survive. So I am going to be very potentially very controversial. I don't agree with dry food. So I've put a table together of pros and cons. And as you can see, the only pro that I could think of is that it's convenient. Now, let me be clear. I, I started pickle on dry food. We've always had cats in our family. And when I had her, she was my very own cat. I was, I felt like a proper adult, you know, I'd, I'd finished uni, moved away, got my very first cat and she was a stray. And she'd been, she had sores on her ears. She'd been through, she'd been through the wars. 
and I just couldn't love her anymore. So we basically, we free fed dry food because that's what I thought was the right thing to do because that's what we're conditioned to believe from pet food manufacturers that, you know, dry food's good for their teeth. I'm going to come on to that and that they can eat it. So yes, it's convenient. You can leave it down if you go out for the day or if you go out overnight. But that's, that's all I could think of. So if you've got any pros of dry food, I'd love to hear them. I really would. Um, personally, I, I don't think it's good. You know, the cons are, are vast there, you know, and that's just what, six, seven, you know, we don't need to leave food down all day for our cats. Cats and, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep going through this webinar, linking back to, to larger cats, you know, and they don't sort of nibble at the carcass throughout the day. They will eat, they will feel full and they will walk away. They'll either bury the prey, they'll leave it or, or whatever. So yes, your cat may be a grazer, but that's not her natural instinct. That's not like normal. So if you leave dry food down all day, cats can have a tendency to overeat. And then you've got an obese cat, which then you know, leads to multiple um, problems, you know, health problems and issues. It has less moisture. So obviously dry food, you know, the components of it, which again, we're going to come on to when we look at how to read a cat food label, are just shocking. You know, as Gabrielle's mentioned, there are grains, there are cereals, rices, potatoes, soya protein, and cats just aren't designed to, to process that. It's not just a question of that's not the right diet for them. They, they're not, they don't have the capacity to digest it all, to process it all. So the fact that it's got less moisture than, than wet food or raw, you know, it's got a lot more salt and sugars. So it leads to dehydration, especially in male cats as well, UTIs, you know, urinary tract infections. And as I said, you know, it's high in cereals and grains. And when you consistently put this into a cat's body, into a mechanism that's not designed to process it, it, it has reactions. We, fre we free fed pickle dry food and she became diabetic. Now, I will never know if one led to the other, if it's cause and effect or just coincidence, but I believe that, that that's what caused it. If you think about how much sugar and how much carbohydrate you're putting into that body, day in, day out, meal after meal after meal, and the, the toll in the pancreas, you know, the, the amount of insulin going through the body trying to counteract those cereals, it's not good. So causes plaque on teeth. <laughs> Some, someone somewhere came up with the idea that giving a cat dry food means that you clean its teeth. And I don't know which bonkers person created that, but my goodness, haven't pet food companies run with it. And it, and it breaks my heart because we look at marketing and as humans, you know, we're conditioned to to understand that to to believe it and it doesn't it dry food doesn't clean their teeth what happens is is it sticks to their teeth and it causes plaque it it causes that buildup on their gums sarah just put my cat needing to have a dental which is one of the reasons for wanting to switch we had the same with pickle she ended up having all her teeth out not not in one go over the years but when when she was diabetic, I did, I did a lot of reading, which is what I said to you at the beginning, this is where this information comes from. I have this book, that you can see, called Your Cat. I'll put it in the comments at the end. Um, and the book taught me how to read labels, what dry food does, what it's made of, how it affects cats. And if you think about when you eat a cream cracker, I know June may not agree with me. Eat a cream cracker, eat a packet of crisps, what happens? It sticks in your teeth, you're, you're picking them out of your teeth for a good sort of five minutes after because they're cereal based, they're, you know, grains, obviously like potatoes, carbs, right? When you eat a steak or a piece of broccoli, I, I'm vegan, so I don't eat steak, but you know, the, the premise is when you eat steak, 
doesn't get stuck to your teeth. And, and we are obviously, we're not carnivores, but we can eat meat. So it doesn't, it's not true, basically. The dry food causes plaque to build up on their teeth because it, it, it sticks to their teeth of the composition of the cereals and the grains. Wild cats, lions, tigers who eat meat and bone and organs, they don't need a dental because the bones will get rid of them, any form of plaque, which they don't have because food doesn't get stuck on them. And finally, the last point I wanted to mention, in fact, there's, there's, there's two. So poor quality can affect behavior. And this is linked with the point above, which is coated, uh, which is that dry food is coated with flavorings and additives. So if you think about how dry food is created, how it's made, all the, all the components, all the elements, all the ingredients are all dried out. They're all dried out, you know, it's all mixed together and then it's all dried out and they're made into little kibble shapes. So why would that be appealing to a cat? <coughs> Excuse me. You know, cats use their sense of smell for everything. Absolutely everything. They use their sense of smell to determine if there's bacteria on their meat, on their flesh, and whether they can eat it or not. They use scent, um, again, I'm not gonna go off on a tangent too much, but they use it for everything, to communicate, to assess their environment. So how can you make dried out, compressed, processed bits of dry kibble appealing to a cat who uses sense of smell? Unfortunately, it's because it's coated with additives, flavorings, preservatives. It's coated in stuff to make it smell, to make it appeal to cats. And what breaks my heart is that cats can get addicted to it. Pickle did. She was so not happy when we decided to try and get her off dry food. We had a, it was, it was really a really tough time. And I'll come on to food transition a bit later in the webinar. But the sad thing is, it's like, you know, giving a child packets of sweets. It's not good for them, but they like it and they don't know any different. And because it's sweet and tasty, they want more and they will, won't be happy when you stop it. So that's just a few reasons why I am really anti dry food. But if we ignore all of those and come back to the basics, the simple point that we started with at the beginning, it's not a species appropriate diet. It's not what cats are designed to process and to survive on. So what are your other options? Your other options are wet food or raw food. So I've always, it's almost like a spectrum, right? You've got dry food, wet food, raw food. And you know, we've, we've been there, we've done it all, <laughs> literally. I started looking into dry food brands when Pickle was diagnosed with diabetic, trying to find you know, a good one. Um, couldn't find one. Again, we'll come on to that in a sec. Then try to find good quality wet food. And that was a challenge. And we ended up coming to raw. Now I know raw food doesn't sit comfortably with everybody. And as I said to a client a couple of weeks ago, you have to pick and choose your battles. So I'm vegan and I don't like the fact that we feed a farmed animal product to Leo. I don't like the fact that Perform comes in plastic sachets, but he needs raw meat. He, he needs meat to survive. So my issues are my issues. I can't, I can't put that onto him. So we feed Leo a mixture of the two pitches I've put here, Perform and Nutriment. Both are raw food. Now, like I said, I, get, I guess I get that raw is not for everyone, but it really is the best thing you can feed your cat. It, it makes their coat shine, it's good for their eyes, their joints. You know, I can't, I haven't listed the ways here because to be honest, I know it, not everybody is comfortable with it. And it's something some, I think you need to kind of almost grow into and, and, and make peace with. So let me just go back a step and talk about wet food. So again, we've been through multiple wet foods with Pickle. She came to us from the rescue center on um, wet and dry food. Like I said, we left the dry food down, she overate, she became very, very large and overweight. 
she became diabetic. I found out through reading and learning that, you know, not only were, was dry food bad for diabetic cats, it was also just horrendously bad for cats in general. So that was the end of the dry food era. Then it was on to wet food. So wet food, it's kind of like, let me think about it. Um, you, you know, you've got good and bad ones again, like with everything. You've got your gold standard and then you've got your, you're not so great. So we're going to talk about ingredients in just a second. But before we get on to that, in the table here, I've put, you know, there's a little R and a little W next to the pros and cons. And what I would say is if raw food's not for you, if you can't bring yourself to serve it up on a plate for your cat, even though it is the best thing for them, if you can't do that, my advice would be get the best quality wet food you can afford. Now I know that obviously COVID's hit, some people have lost their jobs, they're in a financially difficult situation. We make compromises for ourselves and we have to make compromises for the home, whether that's with the kids, the animals, you know, whatever it may be. But just buy the best you can afford. I'll be honest with you, the nutriment and the perform, it's not cheap. We're lucky we're in a position to be able to buy it. We buy it in bulk. So we don't pay as much postage. We've got a, a freezer outside because it's all frozen. So we put it in the freezer outside, you know, and that's the best that we can afford. But we haven't always been in this situation. Pickle used to get a mixture of a brand called Lily's Kitchen. She'd get half Lily's Kitchen as we were kind of branching into raw, she'd get half perform. So Lily's Kitchen was a brand that before they were kind of on the map, shall we say, they were brilliant and Pickle loved it. We noticed straight away a change in her coat um, and her feces and it was fabulous. Sadly, I found recently they, they have an ingredient called carrageenan or carrageenan, I'm not sure how you say it, which is known to be an inflammatory marker. So it's an additive that's added to usually cat food and other products where, a lot, for example, it was, um, it was added to infant formula, but that's now been banned. And it's known, to, it's, it comes from seaweed, people use it to thicken um, products but it's now being found that it can cause inflammation in the digestive tract. So the reason we've taken Leo off it is because he's asthmatic and he's got enough inflammation in his body as it is, I don't wanna add more. So we've, we've taken him off Lily's Kitchen. That being said, Lily's Kitchen is, is a much higher quality brand than for example, shop brands, you know, and the big commercial brands, Whiskers, Felix, Sheba, Go Cat, I hate to say it, they, they're, they're not great. We'll come on to ingredients in just a second. But what I wanted to say is the point, the pros and cons I've put here, you know, wet food and raw food are high in moisture. So although the raw food doesn't look, you know, like sloppy, the, the, the moisture is in the meat and the protein. It's in the actual, you know, flesh. And cats don't drink water like dogs. They have a very low thirst tolerance. So you'll probably find if you've got a cat and dry food, they're drinking a lot. That's because it's, you know, it's dehydrating them, as you mentioned before. Wet food's got a higher moisture content, so it's better for them. Obviously, the raw is high in protein. So with wet food, yes, it's less processed than dry food. But as I said, you do have your good and bad brands. There is usually less cereals and grains, but you really have to look out for other starches and other carbohydrates. And it can be a little bit smelly and messy. So with the raw, raw food, you know, it's quite, com, com, it's, it's quite tightly compacted because it's, it's flesh, right? You know, think about a chicken breast. If you cut that up, it's just lump, lumps of meat. Whereas the wet food is still processed to a degree. And then lastly, the, the, the poo, right? The feces. So I have people contact me. I've seen it on Facebook groups where people say, you know, God, you know, I need to get like, um, a scented litter and my cat's poo smells and it's really stinky and I'll be honest what goes in comes out so Leo's poos don't smell and I'm not making that up genuine they don't smell when he came to us he was on Felix wet and dry from the rescue center and they absolutely stank oh my goodness my, my husband urged once when he was cleaning it up because it was so bad because it's just poor quality and again, if you think about your own body, 
when you have, you know, I don't know, a couple of takeaways or you've eaten some, you know, real junk food, you know, not only are you bloated and usually uncomfortable, but it has an effect on your body. You know, you might get a bit spotty or have an upset tummy, whatever it may be. It's the same with cats to a different degree. You know, what goes in, if it's not good quality, it's going to come out like that too. So with raw food, they don't have smelly poos. In fact, actually, they poo less because they're taking much, much more nutrients from the protein, from the flesh, from the bones, from the offal, that not much needs to come out. They don't need to poop much out because they're keeping all of it inside because it's nutrients for their body. So what to look for on cat food labels? This is a bit of a minefield, and this was something that I had to learn about when Pickle was diagnosed. Like I said, we were on our food journey and I had the shocking revelation dry food was no longer appropriate. So just to draw your attention to the box on the right, the purple, complete pet food for adult cats. Now, when it comes to cat food labels, the first ingredient that they're listed in order of like volume, if you like. So the thing that's got the most will be at the start. So this one on the right, the purple, the first ingredient is cereals. So let's just, you know, let's let that sink in for a moment. Cereals for a carnivore. Okay. Then we've got meat animal derivatives. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Derivatives of vegetable origin, minerals, vegetable protein, extracts. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. So pretty vague, right? The, the requirements and the legislation around pet food labels is really, really mixed. And you can go down a bit of a rabbit hole investigating it all, as I have done many a times, bringing it back to that high level information I said I would share with you. Cereals, not good. Meat and animal derivatives, not good. So basically what that means, and I've highlighted it on all four of them. So the blue packet at the top, which is the wet food, the green at the bottom is the wet food, the tray, the little tray sort of in the middle, wet food, meat and animal derivatives. Now meat and animal derivatives, if you look online, depending where you look, if you look at some of the big brands like Purina and Hills and Royal Canin, They'll tell you that meat and animal derivatives are good for your cat. Again, sadly, I disagree. Meat and animal derivatives is the term that's given to pieces of an animal that are not fit for the human, for human consumption, not fit for the human food chain. So if you think about it, what, what wouldn't you be able to put in like a pie for a human? So hooves, tails, beaks, ears, snouts, toes, all the bits and pieces that, you know, the extremities, if you like. And yes, I said at the beginning, cats are carnivores, they need meat and flesh to survive, and bone and organs. But if you think about the nutritional element, the nutritional quantity or quality of those pieces of an animal, the tail, the feet, the beak, there's not, there's not a lot of nutrients in them. And actually, your cats need more. They need more protein. They need protein, which is in the flesh. They need calcium, which is in the bones. So sadly, meat and animal derivatives, is, if you see that on a packet of cat food, put it down and look for something else. Now, the one to the left, which is really fuzzy, again, taken from a very, very well-known brand, one of which I've mentioned already. The first ingredient says chicken. You think, oh, great. Right? Again, they don't tell you what parts of that chicken that is. It doesn't say chicken breast, doesn't say chicken thigh, doesn't say chicken meat. What I would say, if you find it that says meal, like fish meal, chicken meal, again, not good. That means that basically all those extra bits and pieces that we've just mentioned, they've mashed it all together, they've dried it out, that's what's called fish meal, um, uh, chicken meal, beef meal, it's all the bits and pieces pulled together. Again, on the left, the next ingredient is whole grain wheat, corn gluten meal, you know, animal fat, and then there's brew, brew, brewer's rice, I can never say that word, wheat gluten, chicken liver flavour, so not actual chicken liver, dried beet pulp, again, another, another carbohydrate, 
dried egg product, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and at the end, I don't know if you can see, it says dried carrots, dried cranberries, and dried peas. When have you ever known a, a lion or a tiger to eat carrots, cranberries, and peas? They're added in there because as humans, we, we humanize our animals. We think that, you know, blueberries and cranberries, oh, cranberries are great for, for urine, you know, urinary tract infections or for your waterworks, not for cats. They're carnivores. Yes, they would have an element of plant matter or vegetable matter, which would be in the stomach of their prey. So for example, if Leo ate the mouse that he brought, brought home, there would be the, the, the smallest amount of, you know, greenery, if you like, in the mouse's tummy. But that's, that's it. It's, it's not, it doesn't have, you know, a scoop of blueberries or peas added to its meal every day. And sadly, what I've seen is that even some of the raw food brands or the park cooked brands that are now coming onto the market have got peas and broccoli in, and, and it's just another form of sugars. You know, cats don't need to eat it. So mentioned sugars, the, the blue packet, you know, in the middle there towards the top, meat animal derivatives of which chicken is 4%. Now, is that chicken breast? I don't know. Fish and fish derivatives, minerals and various sugars. Do you want to be giving your cat sugars? Do you, would you want to give a child sugars, knowing the effect it has on their body and their behaviour? We'll come on to that in a little bit. And then just at the bottom, again, this was... A prescription diet. So as I said, I am not against vets. I love allopathic medicine. Leo is asthmatic. We work, I speak to my vet regularly, you know, she's on board with how I treat him. And um, I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, I wouldn't, I, I don't slate vets at all. Fully love my vets. But what makes me sad is the prescription diets that they recommend are still dry food based and they should never be recommending that. What I've heard is that vets get paid, you know, per per bag of food. I don't know how true that is. I don't work at a, I don't work at a veterinary surgery, and I'm not going to slate them for that because they may need to make money like everybody. But if you look at the ingredients in that composition, so dehydrated poultry protein. So again, that could be a beak. That could be, you know, uh, that could be anything. And then we've got vegetable protein isolate. No idea what that means. I couldn't find where the star. There's a little star next to isolate. I couldn't find where the star went in the, um, on the website page. Maize, vegetable fibres, rice, animal fats, hydrolyzed animal proteins, wheat, maize flour, maize gluten, beet pulp, yeast, you know, and, and then at, bottom, at the end, seeds. I mean, how many ingredients are listed there and how many of them are carbohydrate based? And this is meant to be a prescription diet that's meant to help your cat. I just don't see how that how that can be. And, and, and to be honest, if anybody wants to, to educate me otherwise or share information with me, as I said at the beginning, I am really keen to learn. All of this stuff that I'm sharing with you is because it's what I've learned through my journey with Pickle and now with Leo. And I don't understand how it can be any different. I don't see how maize and wheat, and wheat can be good for a carnivore. I, I just don't get it. So what I would say when it comes to look, when you're looking at cat food, if you're going to, if I'm, I hate to think I'm leaving anybody in a tailspin, but if you are feeding dry food, you're cat them and you think, oh my God, I've got to change. And you start to look at wet food, you'll find that everything pretty much has meat and animal derivatives. So as I said to you before, just keep it simple, buy the best food you can afford. Okay. Don't freak out. It is really hard to find a good quality cat food, which is why we've ended up buying raw. Well, so continuing on with the cat food labels, excuse the crappy pictures, <laughs> they're taken in my kitchen. So the one on the right, which is the Perform, which is 100% minced rabbit with ground bone. So what I would say when it comes to feeding raw is um, you need to vary the protein. So this one's rabbit. We've also got another one that's I think it's pheasant or something in it. I'm not sure, but, but vary the protein. But, you know, even with ground bone, there are times all of a sudden we're, we're, I'm sat in the front room and Leo's eating. They hear him crunching something. I'm like, oh my goodness. Even though it's ground bone, there is still little bits of bone in his food. Still going to be great for his teeth. The left is the nutriment. So 
I wanted to give Leo a variation and I don't want to give him chicken, beef or pork because in the food chain they have a lot more antibiotics, chemicals, treatments, you know, there's a lot more in the animal industry to make them big, make them fat and it doesn't sit right with me. In an ideal world, which obviously we don't live in, I'd be feeding Leo, you know, organic meat every day in fact i wouldn't be feeding him he'd be getting it for himself right that's not the way our world works he's a domesticated cat that's not how our life is so i wanted to vary the proteins that he had perform has chicken and beef and turkey uh, chicken beef and pork so we give him the rabbit from there and then we're trying at the moment this nutriment so as you can see there composition whole fresh whole, whole fresh rabbit with bone and off for British turkey with bone, British turkey heart, British turkey liver, Scottish cold water salmon oil, raw sea kelp powder, spirulina powder and wheat gem oil. So all the ingredients I can pronounce, which means we're off to a great start, right? Because in the previous slide, there are things like manganese oxide, mixtocipherols, fructo oligosaccharides. I don't want to be giving that to him. So Yes, when I talked in my self-selection webinar, I said about not adding anything to their food. And again, you've got to pick your battles. I don't like the fact this has got spirulina powder, wheat germ oil, sea kelp powder, and raw salmon oil, and uh, salmon, cold water salmon oil in it. But when you look on the website, they are really small percentages. And if it's a question of giving him this fresh, well, obviously it's frozen, but you know, this raw meat versus compressed and processed beaks, this is a no-brainer, right? So you, you need to, to be comfortable with what you're giving. You need to pick and choose what's the most important thing. The most important thing for me is the quality of the meat that he has because he's a carnivore. So those are the raw foods that we feed. So how can poor quality food affect your cat's behavior? And much, much more. So we've talked about dry food, wet food, raw food. We've talked about what to look for on cat food labels. And we've I'm gonna talk about in a minute about how to tell if your cat's overweight and what to feed your, you know, how to feed your cat. One thing I would say is when I've said to you before, buy the best quality raw food, uh, best quality wet food you can afford, that is really, really key. So if you're feeding your cat dry food, if you look down this list, I'm not gonna go through every single one, um, but the problems that cats have with dry food can lead to problem behaviors. So when I'm working with a client, one of the first questions is, have they been checked by a vet to make sure there's no pain or uh, uh, medical issues going on? Usually the second question, the second thing we discuss is what are they eating? What's going in? What's going into that body, that machine, you know, what's fueling that body, that little body? So with dry food, we said before, it's covered in sugars. It contains sugars, it's coated with additives. And I don't know about you guys, but like with junk food, you know, burgers, pizza, you eat it, you don't actually feel full. I don't, you know, I can, I can overeat a pizza like the best of them. And it's the same with cats. Not only is their body having this massive sugar high up and down, they don't actually feel sated, they don't feel full which is usually why if you've got a cat on dry food, you may think they're a grazer because they keep going back and eating. Or you might find that they can be quite aggressive around food times or that they always seem hungry. It's because they're not full. They've not got the nutrients in them to make them feel full. So we talked about the, the issues with smelly poos. You know, this sadly can lead to litter tray problems. If you're feeding poor quality food, and by that I mean either dry food or a crappy wet food, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, if a cat has got an upset tummy, if they have, you know, digestive issues, they've got diarrhea or constipation. If they're, if they're using a litter tray, sometimes that can be the, the triggering event that can instigate litter tray problems. It means that then they're going around the house, you then got a behavior problem, which comes from actually a nutritional issue. As we talked, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, dry food, because it's got, it's high in salts and carbohydrates, it can be really dehydrating. Like, like I said, you know, I'm sure for those of you that feed dry food, 
Um, you know, you should cat potentially drinks more, always have a fresh water source available, not near their food bowl. Cats will never drink from a water source next to their food. Again, it's an innate um, mechanism from large cats because potentially if there's, you know, a kill next to a water source, you know, it could be infected with bacteria of the decaying body. And again, that's come down through our cats into our domesticated ones. So Pickle had terrible coat issues. She had really bad dandruff when she was on dry and a really crappy uh, wet. When we changed her, actually when we put her onto Lily's kitchen, her dandruff improved and her coat condition was much better. Obviously meant to know about gingivitis and, you know, if your cat's overweight, then that just, you know, let's start another list of health problems. So I'm not saying that dry food causes diabetes, but it's definitely a big indicator, you know, a big contributing factor. Obviously, if your cat's overweight, they're going to have arthritic problems, you know, joint issues, and then potentially thyroid and kidney problems. And the list goes on, right? You know, you know about humans when they when you see the doctor and say you're overweight, they give you a long list of things that could be, you know, that, that could be a reason um, which is affecting your health because you're overweight. So sadly, not only can poor nutrition affect your cat biologically. Physically, it can affect their behavior as well. It can make them aggressive. It can make them reactive. It can make them uh, a bully towards other animals in the house. It can make them crazy, you know, and this is what I said before, if you're trying to, to transition a cat from dry food, you know, it, you, you need to be patient, which I think isn't, yeah. In fact, let's go there now. So how do you transition your cat onto a new food? Be patient, take it slow and make it fun. Those are my three key takeaways for you. So Capri has commented and said, how would you change a diet for a 15 year old cat addicted to dry food? Point number two, Gabrielle, I would say take it slow. What can happen is cats can be very um, reactive and it can become a battle of wills, which is why you need to be patient. Cats don't adjust very well to change. Some adjust better than others, just like humans. Others don't take it very well. And majority of cats are creatures of habit. So what I would say is make a commitment, decide you're going to change the food and commit to it. So don't give up after a couple of days. If it seems like effort and hard work, you need to keep going. You need to be consistent with this change. It's like behavior modification with a cat. You need to keep it consistent. You need to keep going. So take it slow. You know, what I would say is, if for example, so we'll use Gabrielle's uh, example. You're going from dry food, say, to wet food, okay? So put a little teaspoon of wet food down on a, on a plate, on a saucer, on a whatever, cat bowl, and see if the cat will eat it. That's the first step, right? See if your cat's interested. Because sometimes... Cats will be, they like a change, you know, of, of food. If, they, if they're not getting the nutrients that they need from the dry food, they may be interested and try the new wet food. So try it, put a bit down and see. Then I would say you've got to do it slowly. So slowly reduce the amount of dry food. If you're free feeding, stop. If you're free feeding, you need to go to timed feeding. So I would say whatever works with you in terms of your home environment and routine, usually two to four meals a day. Leo gets three meals a day. We get up in the morning, he has food. He has his asthma uh, inhaler, usually about four o'clock and he has food then. And then he has a little bit, usually about half seven, eight o'clock. Depends what your cat needs. So start off slowly. If you're free feeding, stop it and go to time and feeding. One element of transition is to make sure that you put the bowl down, you leave the bowl down for an hour and then you pick it up and you don't put it down again until the next feeding schedule time. So for example, if I put food down at half past seven in the morning, Leo didn't eat it within the hour, it gets picked up and, and either put in the fridge for later if it'll last or you know put down the toilet. Yes, you may waste some food, but you've got to look at the bigger, the bigger picture, look at the end game. What you're doing here is you're trying to help the cat realize that you know they need to eat they need to eat to survive and they will but they've only got a short finite time to do it so yes you're forcing it on them a little but it is almost for their greater good so if you're going from dry to wet i would put a little bit of dry down a little bit of wet down and see what they do 
if they don't eat it within the hour, pick it up, put the same down later. Obviously, if your cat's not eating at all, and some of them will be, will be stubborn, they will be, well, they will put up a protest, is put the dry food back down, but a smaller portion, because then when they're hungry, you can hopefully try the wet food. It, it really all depends on your cat. It depends on their temperament. It depends on how amenable they are to the change. But the last point I put there about making it fun, even if you've got, you know, a 15 year old cat, um, you know, they still need mental stimulation. They still need physical stimulation. So, you know, this sounds a bit gross. It's easier with raw food than with wet food, but get a bit and, you know, flick it across the room or, or you know, just sort of nudge it a little bit or get something called a lick mat, which has got a little prongs, not prongs, but little wedges in it. And you can smear the food across it. Again, it's a form of mental stimulation. Go and put it in the corner of the room. You know, pick up the dry food, put the, the, um, the mat in the corner, at the corner of the room and your cat will hunt it out because it will smell. So you're, you're instigating this inner predator, this, the, the, the inner drives and, and instincts of the cat by doing it. So it's all about sort of trial and error. You know, it's all about seeing what works with your cat. So be patient, take it slow and make it fun. And also, like I said, just be, con in fact, I should have put a fourth point, be consistent, make a commitment to change, get the brand that you want them to be on and then take that journey together. What I would say, naturally, I was going to mention at the end, Naturally Cats has got a discussion group on Facebook. So if you're not already a member, come along and join us. I've been posting about the nutriment journey with Leo, transitioning him from Leo's, uh, Lily's Kitchen to Nutriment and Perform. There's another lady called Melissa. She's been talking about her ragdoll Quincy, who she's been transitioning from wet food to raw food, and also in, in, um, bringing into that the time of feeding. And we were able to give her, you know, reassurance because at one point he wouldn't eat. I suggested playing with it. Another lady suggested something else. So, you know, come and join our discussion group. You know, it's it's not, a, you know, there's not thousands of people in it, but it's a really great community where people can share information, ask questions and get support. So on Facebook, look for Naturally Cats Discussion Group. There are a couple of questions to answer, which just says if you've got cats and what you're looking to get from the group and the, saying that you'll agree to the rules. Um, but come and, come and join us. Okay, so how much should you feed your cat? The age old question. If anybody has typed this into Google, I'd love to know the number of results you had because I had absolutely loads. The reason I looked is because I wanted to see if there was a magic formula, knowing that there wasn't, but wondering if anybody had created one. And unfortunately, there is no one size fits all answer. There are elements that you need to consider and for each cat, they are really important. So age, activity level, any previous or prior medical conditions, the current weight, breed, size, the quality of the food and their appetite. So again, another curveball from me, I don't agree with this, the age banding of food for cats. So again, in this book, in the Your Cat book, um, Elizabeth talks about a cat will eat what it needs. Apart from when it comes to dry food, they're addicted and will eat it like it's um, Haribo. A kitten will eat more because they need more fat and protein. An elderly cat will eat less because they need less. This comes back to my premise of giving cats a voice. It comes back to giving them the option to be in control of their environment, to eat what they need to eat. Now, yes, if you've got a food driven cat, that could potentially be difficult and you may have to intervene and support them with portion size. But look at how, look at your cat. So on the left, I've included a body um, a muscle condition score. This is from the um, International Cat Care, previously the Feline Advisory Bureau. And this is a body condition chart. So basically with cats, you can't say a four kilogram cat is an ideal weight because it depends on all those elements I've put on the side there. So, you know, if you've got uh, a Bengal whose activity level is off the chart, it's very different to a ragdoll who's potentially, you know, a lot more aloof and not as active. If you've got a cat that's got a thyroid problem, they're gonna have different nutritional requirements to a cat that doesn't have a thyroid problem whether you've got an indoor or an outdoor cat depends. And obviously, like I said, age. 
So the first step I would say, if you're trying to assess your cat's um, nutritional needs and their dietary requirements is start with a chart, look at where your cat is. Look at where your cat is, look at what you're feeding. So the first step is to look at the size of your cat. Are they ideal, overweight or underweight? Do you need to be feeding a little bit more because they're underweight? Do you need to be feeding a little bit less because they're overweight and you're trying to lose weight? Then look at what you're feeding. So, for example, Perform and Nutriment, they have, in fact, every, um, every cat food brand will have on it recommended feeding guidelines, which gives you an indication as to the quality of the food because they're more the thing to feed the less quality, the, the, the lower the quality of the food. So, for example, a popular brand will say two sachets of wet and a bowl of dry. Again, that's not going not, not to go over the dry um, situation again. But, for example, let me see if the performs got it. So it should say whether, yeah, whether it's the complete cat food or not. In fact, I think the picture is on the bottom right for perform. But with the, the feeding guide for the nutriment, adult cats should be fed 2 to 3% of their ideal body weight. So, for example, a 5K cat is given 100 and 150 grams a day. So basically just short of one of those sachets. So see if your cat's overweight, underweight, or ideal. Look at the quality of the food that you're feeding and look at their nutritional requirements, uh, look at their uh, feeding guidelines, and then make adjustments. So, you know, if Leo was, was overweight, if he was in category seven, I would probably look to, to feed him half of that sachet a day. Do you see what I mean? So, you, you know, you're, you're reducing his intake because he needs to lose some of the fat off his body. So have have a think about you know what where is your cat on that chart and to be honest always get a second opinion so if you're going to look to make food changes or dietary changes if you've got the capacity to be in consultation with your vet i would always advise that <clears throat> excuse me it's like with humans you don't want to lose the weight too quickly because it can be bad for the body you know if you're going to implore a, a weight um reduction or increasing regime speak to a vet about it just so that they're on board and they're aware of what you're doing we monitor Leo's cat regularly. Uh, monitor Leo's cat regularly. We monitor Leo's weight regularly, because we because we're changing his food. I need to know what's happening with his body. So before we started, he was three point eight kilos. Now he's four point one. So I'm aware we need to keep an eye on that, and it's probably gone up because we were feeding him two different brands at the same time. So we're not only transitioning him, we're trying to figure out what is his ideal portion size. So at the moment, that's okay. It's fine for him to put on a little bit of weight. We are monitoring that away at least once a month, if not twice. And once we have got rid of the Lily's Kitchen and we finish the, the backlog of food that we've got and we're on to nutriment and perform full time, we will then work out, you know, perform says, for example, feed three sachets, nutriment says feed, you know, one container, what, what is going to work best for him. And it's the same for your cat. So even if you're feeding Sheba and Go Cat, which are you know bad brands, but if that's what you what you can afford, that's what you've got, that's what you're feeding. Look at the nutritional requirements of your cat. Look at the conditions that I've mentioned here, and look at whether they need to lose weight, gain weight, or stay the same. And then bring that into conjunction with the fact of how much the feeding guidelines are stated on the packet. So we've covered how to transition your cat. Cool. So we've come to the end. Uh, I, like I said, I've got so much more I could have talked about. It's difficult to say you need to feed X amount or this is the requirement for, for cats in general. It doesn't work that way. Um, but I really hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. This is where you can get in touch with Naturally Cat. So it's the, the website and email. So I said, well, there's a Facebook business page and also the Naturally Cats discussion group. So come along and join us. I'm also on Instagram. Um, and uh, just to mention also that um, on the website there is the shop page where I sell herb gardens which are dried herbs for cats so you'll probably see if you follow me on social media um, I'm all about giving cats a voice and I'm starting to do that at the moment with the herb garden shop so trying to help people understand how herb gardens and you know natural dried herbs and flowers can enrich their cat but also help them so for example if your cat has got digestion issues they've got diarrhea or constipation you know i've got a garden that has remedies that support that so it helps to soothe their digestive tract soothe their tummy um, and support them with uh, with that condition so head on over to the website and check it out um and uh if i would love to hear from you guys so either email me and get in touch let me know what other webinars you'd like to see or tag me on social media with the hashtag giving cats a voice it is one of it is part of my mission to change the world's perception of cats to have this hashtag 
be used frequently to be viral because I want people to realize that we can speak up for our cats. We can be the voice for our cats. So any questions? Let me come out of the presentation. If you've got any questions, it's going to take a couple of minutes now. Pop your questions in the chat box and we will, we will cover them. Let me just get back to the chat. Okay. Okay, let's see what we've got so far. Why do all the food producers add grains to cat food? Because it's cheap, sadly, because it's cheap and it's a filler. My cat needs to have a dental, is that reason for wanting to switch? Yeah, totally, totally feel you, Sarah. Like I said, that's how we started, you know, part of the reasons we changed with pickle. One of my cats. One of my cats just doesn't want to eat fresh food and always ask for try. Yeah. Sadly, Gabrielle, I'd say they're potentially addicted to it. You know, it is a big change. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried raw, but you know, try it and give it a go. Megan, any advice for elderly cats? I foster adopt three of them. My youngest is 12 at the moment. Oh wow. Megan, so elderly cats. <laughs> I think that might have to be another webinar. Um, do you mean in terms of food? Or do you mean like just just because just because they're elderly? Let me know and I'll, I'll see if I can answer that. How can I change the diet for a 15 year old cat addicted to dry food? Yeah, Gabrielle, slowly, slowly. And, and like I said, make it fun, you know, get a lick pad, um, introduce her to it, see, um, see what they're interested in trying something different and do it really, really slowly. So, you know, older cats are generally a bit more kind of stuck in their ways as well but just be patient, commit to, to changing if that's what you want to do. Um, or if you think it will cause extra stress to the cat, stick on, stick on the dry food. My sister is a vet, we have this <laughs> discussion regularly. I, I don't doubt it, Sarah. I mean, in a way, I'm grateful that I don't have any vets in my family because I think we would uh, consistently have that discussion as well. I'm only gonna change that, okay. Right, yes, I've got other, those other questions here, Sarah, just one second. Can you give the exact name of the frozen? Yeah, okay, so. So to put them in the chat. So perform, because we've been a, uh, a customer for three, four, four years, over four years, I am um, not affiliated with them, but I have a discount code. I've got a 5% discount code that people can use. So if you're interested, tag me or contact me on social media and I will um, give you the link and give you the, the code to use it. They do have a minimum requirement in terms of your first order, but um, hopefully the 5% off should help with it. Again, anything to do or not to do because of their age and kidney function, etc. Okay, so what I would say is it kind of goes without saying that obviously regular vet checkups. So yes, Older cats can suffer with more medical problems. Looking out for behavior changes is really key when it comes to elderly cats and noticing if, um, if their uh, behavior changes, get them checked out. What I would say is if you have a cat that's got kidney or like renal failure or kidney issues, that is a separate issue. I did mention that, um, when did we talk about that? Possibly the self-selection river, not was it a hot topic? Um, the, the, Melissa is in the Naturally Cats discussion group, Megan, and she had a cat that had um, uh, kidney failure, renal issues, and she mentioned about her being on, I think it was a high phosphorus diet. It's not something I've had experience of, so I wouldn't feel comfortable commenting, but if you come and join the group, or if you drop me an email, if you've got some questions, if you're not on Facebook, um, I'm happy to take them to Melissa and get some feedback. But basically, like I mentioned it just at the end, if there's a medical condition, you need to speak about to your vet about what's the best to feed them. I would still advise that raw is best because, come back to basics, they're carnivores, they need meat, flesh, bone, organs to survive. But you need to consider the content um, of, of those proteins. Some proteins may be better than others, um, and you may need a supplement. So um, just you know, work in conjunction with your vet, I would say. So a couple of questions. Uh, hang on a sec, is that frozen for me? Yeah, okay. Any other questions, drop them in there. I'm just gonna read a cut through, go through a couple of questions that were sent to me offline. So Lies Brothman asked, losing weight successfully with a food obsessed cat. Yeah, not easy. Like I said, you need to be patient and you need to go slow. So what I would say, if it's a food obsessed cat, if it's 
potentially likely they're on dry food and they're not full. So if you think about a food obsessed cat, is it because they were previously astray or they were feral and they've had to fight for food? Is it an innate behaviour element to them that they are so desperate to have food because it's a primary driver for cats to have food to survive? Or is it because of what you're feeding? Is it because they're not actually um, full and not getting on the nutrients they require, which is why they're, they're after more food, more food, more food? So look at where the driver's coming from, if you know that, if you had the cat from a young age. If not, look at the nutrients and uh, the nutritional um, makeup of what you're feeding and consider that. But again, just go slow, make it fun and commit to it. I, I can't stress that enough. You know, committing to making the changes is hard work for you. It's hard work for the cat, but it can really bring great results. Like I said, their coat condition um they sometimes they're even their mobility and things like I said, their behavior obviously the health elements as well so it does have a really good um, impact on them so sarah mentioned best approach to transition to a species appropriate diet so i think i've kind of covered that if i haven't if you've got any more questions please let me know but like i said slow and steady how to create balanced homemade food on a budget so what i would say is i don't have experience of that again we I've looked into it when Pickle was diagnosed with diabetes and I want and I couldn't find the food that I wanted. Um, we didn't perform wasn't out there straight away. So we looked, I looked into it a little and it was a bit of a minefield again, another kind of rabbit hole because you need to consider varying the proteins. You need to consider having, you know, the, obviously the bone element. So you need to provide them with the calcium um, and also looking at where the meat comes from. So I know getting my food from performant nutriment that they are pet food manufacturing registered. So basically, you know, they're, they're registered to be able to put that food product into a package and say that a cat can eat it, like with humans, right? You know, it's human grade, you know, you know that it's safe to eat, it's not got any contaminants in it. You can't guarantee that with, if you were making it, you're making it yourself. It's not as easy as just going and getting a packet of mints and giving it to them because they've got other requirements, like I said, with the calcium and things. Again, what I would say is, is um, either join discussion groups online or if you're on Facebook there are um, raw food groups again there's a lady actually in the naturally cats discussion group and she she was a part of I can't think what the group raw feeding for raw feeding for something I don't know whether it was IBD like inflammatory bowel disease uh, cats um, but she, but I invited her to the group. So, you know, come and join us. Um, if, if you're on, you are on Facebook, aren't you? Because you're through Cam. Come and join us, Sarah, and ask her questions um, uh, because she'll be able to point you in the right direction. Like I said, it's not something that I'm comfortable advising on when I've not had experience of it myself. And then finally, how to get balance with whole food rather than supplements. Yeah, so that kind of comes back to the self-selection webinar that we had before. So, you know, if you, if you come back to the basics where we started at the beginning, Cats need protein, they need flesh, bones, and organs. Um, what I would say is if you want to try a treat, you know, and if you want to try and see how your cat will be with something different, I would advise trying them with a tin of like um, like sardines in, not in brine, because that would make it really super salty, the water, but like a tin of sardines in either olive oil or sunflower oil. So if you mash that up and put it down onto a plate, uh, you know, onto a food bowl and see what the cat does. Again, because you've got the bones obviously running through the fish, it's a great source of calcium. When you've got the oil that, it's, that it comes in, it's great for their coat. But because you're putting it down as a, as a choice, as an option, the cat can decide whether they want to eat it or not. So it comes back to self-selection. Also, we talked before about um, actually with elderly cats, how can you support them? In fact, I've just remembered it was a hot topic, um, Mega. We talked about elderly cats as a hot topic. We talked about how to support them, you know, physically, mentally. And one of the parts there was about supplements and um, how to help their mental, fun mental health, you know, their mental function. Um, and a couple of the remedies I suggested were having, uh, putting down again on sauces so that your cat can choose, never add it to food, but putting down St. John's wort, macerated oil, um, either uh, nettle or chickweed macerated oils. So macerated oils are when you've got the, like the leaves of plants, you know, they're steeped in, in a carrier oil and the, the properties of the plant come out into the oil, really nutrient rich. Um, 
so again help with joints uh, and um, old age but also when it comes to the supplement elements for like say you know a, a teenage cat for example give them the option if they're an indoor cat grow cat grass you know barley grass the tips are so full of nutrients and it's a great way to give them that option you can buy barley grass and spirulina online again make sure where you can it's organic and as high quality as possible so again the more you spend this it is the way the more you spend the better quality it will be i buy my supplements um from the wild health shop which is caroline ingram or my animal matters which is rachel windsor not because i know that they are zoom pharmacognosy based i know that they're for animals so those are the two that i would recommend because that's where i get mine from Leo's currently got down at the moment uh, a little jar, a little dish with um, spirulina and organic sunflower oil and next to it nettle powder in sunflower oil. He was sick yesterday. Um, I noticed that he'd eaten some bird seed. Why, why, why did he do that? Um, so when it comes to supplements, yes, I agree that you don't that you want them to be, you know, organic and natural rather than, you know, synthetic. But I would also bring it back to self-selection. I would bring it back to giving your cat the, the capacity to have that choice so you know i mentioned the herb gardens the herb gardens are a great way to see what's going on with your cat you know i sell my gardens uh, in like categories so for example digestion pain inflammation loss sadness general anxiety depression uh, and a couple of others so those remedies if you put them down your cat selects them you know rubbing on them and rolling on them you know, you can have a think about, okay, so what, why do they need to be uplifted? Why are they, do they seem like they're suffering with depression? Or if you put peppermint down and the cat licks it, I wonder if they've got inflammation of their digestive tract. So starting with a herb gun is a great way to kind of start to read your cat more and listen to your cat more. I know I'm slightly digressing, um, but it is a really a great way to start to read the animal, read the cat. Um, and then if you're familiar with self-selection, best advice I can give you, buy something and give it a go you know when i talked to nayana i said to her that i always put spirulina down in sunflower oil and leo loves it pickle would never have it as a carrier she always had it as a dry powder i posted a picture the other day she got all over her face we used to get spirulina everywhere but she would only ever have it as a dry powder whereas leo only has it in sunflower oil nayana said that she puts spirulina down in water for her animals so you know, as long as you're giving them a choice, as long as you're putting it down in a saucer or a plate or dish, whatever, and you're letting them come to and from it, that's that's the key when it comes to supplements. Obviously, and I'm going to kind of have this as a finishing note, supplements are no, um, uh, are no replacement for veterinary care. You know, if your cat needs medicine, your cat needs medicine. You know, Leo is asthmatic, he's on steroids because at the moment I haven't found a natural way to deal with his asthma because it can be quite chronic. So we, we, you know, we are transitioning him from putting steroid tablets in his food. Again, like I said, I don't like adding it to his food, but he needs to have his tablets and I can grab him to put them down his throat um, to having the asthma inhaler on his face. So adding supplements to food, you know, I don't recommend it unless like I said, it's medicine, you know, a medical based or a medical reason and you need to do it. When it comes to supplements, if you think your cat is lacking something, ask it. Cats are so intuitive. They're such an amazing species. Even though yours may be a little bit dopey or a little bit crazy or, you know, have mad moments around the house, they still have that natural capacity in them to know what they need. So trust it, explore it and have fun with it. So I hope that's been useful this morning. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I've gone slightly over being quarter past 10. So thank you all for your time today. As I said, if you've got any other questions, comments, feel free to either email me, contact me on social media. I'd love to hear from you. And also any other topics that you'd like me to cover in another webinar, then just give me a shout. Thank you very much for joining me, everybody. And I hope you have a lovely day. Take care, everyone. Bye.